ओम ज्ञानातिमरांधस्य ज्ञानांजना सलाखया चक्षुरोन्मीलित तस्म श्री गुरव नम श्री चैतन्य मनोभीष्टम स्थापित येन भूतले स्वयं रूपा कथा मह्यम ददाती स्वदाति वंदेह श्री गुरो श्रीयुतपदकमलान्ीगुवैष्णवांश श्रीरूप सागर जाता सह गण रघुनाथन्ता ताम सजीव साइत सवधूत परिजन सहित कृष्ण चैतन्य श्रीराधाकृष्णपदा सह गण ललित श्री विशाख अन्विता नवम विष्णुपादा कृष्ण प्रस्था भूतले श्रीमते भक्ति वेदातस्वामी नामिने नमस्ते सारस्वतीदेव गौरवाणी प्रचारिणे निर्विशेषून्यवादी पाश्चातारिणे वंचकुभ्य कृपा सिंधुभ्य पति पावनेभ्यो वैष्णवेभ्यो नमो नम जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभो निनंद श्री अद्वैत गाधर श्रीवासादी गौरभक्तवृंद हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे रीडिंग फ्रॉम श्रील प्रभुपा लीलामृत वॉल्यूम वन चैप्टर नाइनटीन कंटिन्यूइंग इन इट इन एविटेबली मीटिंग विद प्रभुपा मेंट अ फिलोसॉफिकल डिस्कशन चक आई आज डेम कैन यू टीच मी राज योगा ओ ही सेड हियर इज भगवद गीता ही हैंडेड मी अ कॉपी ऑफ द गीता टर्न टू द लास्ट वर्स ऑफ सिक्स चैप्टर ही सेड एंड रेड एंड रीड I read the translation out loud, and of all yogas, he who is worshiping me with faith and devotion, I consider to be the best. I couldn't comprehend what faith and devotion meant, so I said, "Sometimes I'm getting some light in my forehead. That is hallucination," he said. So abruptly he said it, although he did not strain his person. The words came out, came at me so intensely that it completely shocked me. Raja means king, king yoga. He said, but this is emperor yoga. I knew that he had attained such a high state not by using chemicals from a laboratory or by any Western speculative process, and this was certainly what I wanted. Are you giving classes? I asked. He said yes. If you come at six in the morning, I am giving classes in the Gita, and bring some flower or fruit for the deity. I looked into the adjoining room, which was bare with a wooden parquet floor, bare walls, and a tiny table. And on the table was a picture of five hand, human-like figures, with their arms raised above their heads. Somehow, their arms and faces were not like any mortal uh, that I had ever seen. I knew that picture was looking at me. When I came out on the street in front of the storefront, there were a few people standing around, uh, and I said, "I don't think I am going to take uh, LSD anymore." I said it out loud to myself, but some other people heard me. Steve, I wanted to show my appreciation for spiritual India, so I presented to Swami Ji that I had read the autobiography of Gandhi. It was glorious. I said, "What is glorious about it?" Swami Ji challenged. When he asked this. there were others present in the room although i was a guest he had no qualm about challenging me for having said something foolish i searched through my remembrances of gandhi's autobiography to answer his challenging question what is glorious i began to relate that one time gandhi as a child although raised as a vegetarian was induced by some of his friends to eat meat and that night he felt that a lamb was howling in his belly Swami ji dismissed this at once saying most of india is vegetarian that is not glorious i couldn't think of anything else glorious to say and swami ji said his biography is called experiments with truth but that is not the nature of truth it is not to be found by someone's experimenting truth is always truth although it was a blow to my ego being exposed and defeated by swami ji seemed to be a, to be a gain for me i wanted to bring before 
him many different th- things for his judgment just to see what he had to say about them i showed him the paperback edition of bhagavad gita that i have was reading and carrying in my back pocket he pursued the back cover there was a reference to the eternal faith of the hindus and swami ji began to take the phrase apart he explained how the word hindu was a misnomer and does not occur anywhere in the sanskrit literature itself he also explained that hinduism and hindu beliefs were not eternal bruce after i talked about my desire for religious life i began telling him about a conflict i had had with one of my professors in english literature he was a freudian so he would explain the characters in all the novels and so on in a freudian context and with freudian terminology everything was sexual the mother for the son this one for that one and so on but i would always see it in terms of a religious essence i would see it in terms of a religious impulse or some desire to understand god i would write my papers in that context and he would always say the religious can also be interpreted as freudian freudian so i didn't do very well in the course i was mentioning this to the swami and he said your professor is correct i was surprised i was going to an indian swami and he is saying that the professor was correct that everything is based on sex and not religion this kind of pulled the rug out from under me when he said that then he qualified what he said he explained that in the material world everyone is operating on the basis of sex everything that everyone is doing is being driven by the sex impulse so he said fruit is correct everything is on the basis of sex then he clarified what material life is and what spiritual life is in spiritual life there is a complete absence of sex desire so this has a profound effect on me he wasn't confirming my old sentimental ideas but he was giving me new ideas he was giving me his instructions and i had to accept them talking to the swami was very nice i found him completely natural and i found him to be very artistic the way he held his head the way he enunciated his words very dignified very gentlemanly the boys found swami ji not only philosophical but personal also steve a few nights later i went to see the swami and told him i was reading his book one thing that had specially caught my attention was a section where the author of shrimad bhagavatam vyasadeva was admitting that he was feeling despondent then his spiritual master narada explained that his despondency had come because although he had written so many books he had neglected to write in such a way as uh, to fully glorify krishna after hearing this vyasadeva compiled the shrimad bhagavatam when i read this i ident- i identified with the fact that vyasadeva was a writer because i considered myself as a writer also and i knew that i was also despondent this was very interesting about the author vyasadeva i said he wrote so many books but still he was not satisfied because he had not directly praised krishna although i had very little understanding of krishna consciousness swami ji opened his eyes very wide surprised that i was speaking on such an elevated subject from the shrimad bhagavatam he seemed pleased chak i have come by in the afternoon and swami ji had given me a plate of prasadam so i was eating and a chili burned my mouth swami said is it too hot yes i said so he brought me a tiny tea cup with some milk and then he took some rice off my plate and took a piece of banana and crushed it all up together with his fingers and said here eat this it will kill the action of the chilies bruce there wasn't anything super superficial, superficial about him nor was he ever contrived trying to make some impression he was just completely himself in the swami's room there was no furniture so we sat on the floor and i found this to be very attractive and simple everything was so authentic about him and up down at another swami ji swami's place we had sat on big stuffed living room chairs and the place had been lavishly furnished but here was the downtown swami wearing simple clothes robes he had no business suit on it on he wasn't covering up a business suit with those saffron robes and he wasn't affected as the other swami was so i found myself asking him if i could be his student and he said yes i was very happy because he was so after 
so different from other swami from the other swami with the uptown swami i was wanting to become his student because i wanted to get something from him i wanted to get knowledge it was selfishly motivated but here i was actually emotionally involved i was feeling that i wanted to become the swami's student i actually wanted to give him something because i thought he was great and what he was giving was pure and pristine and wonderful it was a soothing balm for the horrible city life uptown i had felt like a stranger On one occasion our conversation turned to my previous trip to India in 1962 and I began talking about how much it meant to me how much it moved me I even mentioned that I had made a girlfriend there so we got to talking about that and I told him that I had her picture I was carrying the girl's picture in my wallet so swami ji asked to see I took out uh, took out the picture and swami ji looked at it and made a sore face and said oh she is not pretty girls in india are more beautiful than that hearing that from the swami just killed any attachment i had for that girl i felt ashamed that i had an interest in a girl that the swami didn't consider pretty i don't think i ever looked at the photograph again and certainly i never gave her another thought bruce was an was a newcomer and had only been to one week of meeting at the storefront so no one had told him that the meetings of ananda ashram dr mishra's yoga retreat had invited swami ji and his followers for a day in upstate countryside bruce had just arrived at the storefront one morning when he heard someone announce the swami is leaving and prabhat came out of the building and stepped into a car in a fit of anxiety bruce thought that the swami was leaving them for good for india no howard told him we are going to a yoga ashram in the country but the other car had already left and there was no room in swami ji's car just then steve showed up he had expected the boys to come by his apartment to pick him up they both had missed the ride bruce phoned a friend up in the bronx and convinced him to drive them up to ananda ashram but when they got to bruce friend's apartment the friend had decided he didn't, didn't want to go finally he lent bruce his car and swami ji two new followers set out for ananda ashram by the time they arrived prabhupad and uh, his group were already taking prasadam sitting around a picnic table beneath the trees ananda ashram was a beautiful place with sloping hills and lots of trees and sky and green grass and a lake the two late comers came walking up <clears throat> to swami ji who was seated like the father of a family at the head of the picnic table keith was serving from a big yoke on to the individual plates when prabhupad saw his two stranglers he asked them to sit next to him and keith served them prabhupad prabhupad took steve chapati and uh, heaped it up with a mound of sugar and steve munched at the bread and sugar while everyone laughed Prabhupada began talking somehow about lion tamers and he recalled that once at a fair he had seen a man wrestling with a tiger rolling over and over with it down a hill the boys who rarely heard swami ji speak anything but philosophy were surprised they were delighted city kids taken to the country by their guru and uh, having a good time steve i was uh, uh, walking with swami ji across a long gentle slope i wanted him to see and approve a picture of radha and krishna i had found in a small book narada bhakti sutra i had planned to get a color reprodu- uh, reproduction of it for to give it give to each of his followers so as we were walking across the grass i show, showed him the picture and asked him whether it was a nice picture of radha and krishna for reproducing he looked at the picture smiled nodded and said yes bruce i walked with swami ji around the grounds all the others were doing something else and swami ji and myself were walking along he was talking about building a temple there prabhupad walked across the scenic acreage uh, uh, um looking at the distant mountains and forests and keith walked beside him prabhupad spoke of him uh, of how dr mishra had offered him the island in the middle of ashrams lake to build a temple on what kind of temple were you thinking of keith asked how big prabhupad smiled and gestured across the horizon as big as the whole horizon 
Keith laughed. Yes, Prabhupada replied. A few uh, Anand Ashram men and women came by. One woman was wearing a sari. Prabhupada turned to the other woman and said, A woman who wears a sari looks very feminine. It was late afternoon when some of the Swamiji's followers gathered by the lake and began talking candidly about Swamiji and speculating about his relation to God and their relation to him. Well, said Valley, Swami never claimed to be God or in incarnation, but he says that he is a servant of God, teaching love of God. But he says that the spiritual master is not different from God, said Howard. They stood at the edge of the mirror, uh, calm lake, and concluded that it was not necessary to talk about this. The answers would be revealed later. None of them really had much spiritual knowledge, but they wanted their faith to deepen. Afterward, Keith Valley and Howard wandered into the meditation room. There was a seat with a picture of Dr. Mishra, who was away in the Europe. But the most remarkable thing was a blinking strobe light. I feel like I am in a head shop on St. Mark's Place, said Valley. What kind of spiritual meditation is this? Howard asked. A Mishra follower wearing a white kurta, white bell bottom, replied that their guru had said they could sit and meditate on this light. Swamiji says you should meditate on Krishna, says Keith. After sunset, everyone gathered in the large room of the main building to watch a slideshow. It was a low, loose collection, mostly of assorted slides of India and the Ananda Ashram. A record by a popular Indian sitarist was playing in the background. Some of the slides were of Vishnu temples, and uh, when one slide passed by quickly, Prabhupada asked, Let me see that. Can you go back and let me see that temple again? This happened several times when he recognized familiar temples in India. Later in the show, there were several slides of a girl, one of the members of Dr. Mishra's ashram, demonstrating India Indian dance poses. As one of her pictures passed, an ashram man joked, "Turn back and turn back and let me see that temple again." The joke seemed at Swamiji's expense and in poor taste. His followers didn't laugh. Then came Swamiji's lecture. He sat up cross leg on a couch in the largest room in the mansion. The room was filled with people, the Swami's followers from the lower east side as well as Anand Ashram yogis sitting on the floor or standing along the walls and in the doorway. He began his talk by criticizing democracy. He said that because people are attached to sense gratification, they vote for a leader who will fulfill their own lust and, and greed. And that is their only criteria for picking a leader. He went on for 45 minutes to explain about the importance of Krishna consciousness, his reel to reel tape recorder moving slides uh, silently. Then he led a kirtan that bridged all differences and brought out the best in everyone that night. Several nights before, in his apartment on 2nd Avenue, Prabhupada had taught his followers how to dance. They had formed a line behind him while he demonstrated the simple step. Holding his arms above his head, he would first swing his left foot forward across the right foot and then bring it back in a sweeping motion. Then he would swing his right foot over his left and bring it back again. With his arms upraised, Prabhupada would walk forward, swing his, swinging his body from one side to other, left foot to right side, right foot to the left side, in time with the two, three, four, uh, sorry, one, two, three rhythm. He had shown them the step in a regular time and in a slow half-time rhythm. Keith had called it the Swami step, as if it were a new ballroom dance. Prabhupada's followers began dancing and soon the others joined them moving around the room in a rhythmic cycle of ecstasy, dancing, swaying, sometimes leaping and whirling. It was a joyous hover, long kirtana, the Swami encouraging everyone to the fullest, fullest extent. <clears throat> a visitor to the ashram happened to have his string bars with him and he began expertly turning out his own swinging bars improvisation. Uh, beneath the Swami's melody, while another man played the tablas. The Anand Ashram members had been divided of late into two, ten, two tens stand of fish of groups. There was the elderly crowd similar to the old ladies who had attended the Swami's 
uptown lectures and there was the young crowd mostly hip couples but in the kirtan their rifts were forgotten and as they discovered later even healed whether they liked it or not almost all of them present were induced to rise and dance then it was late the swami took rest in the guest room and his boys slept outside in their sleeping bags howard i awaken three or four times and each time i am flat on my back looking up at the stars which are always in different positions my sense of time is confused the side reel shifts dizzy me they just before morning i dream then just before morning i dream i dream of devotees clusters clustered around a beautiful golden youth to see him is to be captivated his transcendental body radiates an absolute beauty unseen in the world stunning i inquired who is he doesn't he, you know someone says that's the swami i look carefully but seen no resemblance the youth appears around 18 st- st- straight out of vaikuntha the spiritual world if that's swami ji i wonder to myself why doesn't he come to earth like that a voice somewhere inside me answers people would follow me for my beauty not for my teachings and i awake startled the dream is clear in my mind more like a vision than a dream i feel strangely refreshed bathed in some unknown balm again i see that the constellations have shifted and that the dimmer stars have faded into encroaching encroaching dawn i remember swami ji telling me that although most dreams are simply functions of mind dreams of mind dreams of spiritual master are of sig- spiritual significance keith also had a dream that night keith i saw krishna and arjuna on the battlefield of kurukshetra arjuna was inquiring from krishna and krishna was reciting the bhagavad gita to him then that picture phased out phased out and the images changed and there was swami ji and i was kneeling in front of him and the same dialogue was going on i had the understanding that now is the time and swami ji is presenting the same thing as krishna and we are all in the position of arjuna the dream made it very clear that hearing from swami ji was as good as hearing from krishna the sun rose over the mountain streaking the morning sky above the lake with colors Vail and Keith were walking around the grounds saying to Prabhupada how beautiful it all was. We are not so concerned with the beautiful scenery, said Prabhupada. We are concerned with the beautiful one who has made the beautiful scenery. Later, Prabhupada sat next to Bruce in the Volkswagen returning into the city. The car went winding around on a ribbon of smooth black mountain road with lush green forests close in and intermittent vistas of mountains and expansive sky it was a rare occasion for bruce to be driving prabhupad in a car because none of the swami's boys had car they would always travel by bus or subway it seemed fitting for the swami to have a car to ride in but this was only a little forced wagon and bruce winced whenever they hit a bump and it jostled uh propat as they wound their way on through the mountains bruce recalled something he had read in a book by aldous huxley's wife about the best places for meditation one opinion had been that the best place to meditate was on a large body of water because of the negative ions in the uh, in the air and uh, other opinion was that it was better to meditate in the mountains because you are higher up and closer to the god is this the better for spiritual realization to meditate in the mountains bruce asked propat replied this is nonsense there is no question of better place are you thinking that god is up on some planet or something you and and you have to go up high no you can meditate anywhere just chant hare krishna after some time the drive became tiring for propat and he dozed his head resting forward bruce walked with swami ji up to the his apartment opening the door for him adjusting the window as he liked it and preparing things in this in his room as if he were that swami's personal uh, servant propa settled back into his second avenue apartment feeling pleased with the visit of to ananda ashram the kirtan had been successful and one of dr mishra's foremost students have 
commented that he was impressed by Prabhupada's followers. Simply by chanting, they seem to be achieving an advanced level of yoga discipline, uh, whereas we have more difficulty with all our postures and breath control. The United States recently increased uh, involvement in Vietnam was creating an increase of opposition to the war. On July 29th, April, a fl- a American plane had bombed North Vietnam's two major population centers, Hanoi and Haiphong, an escalation which brought ex- expressions of regret from several elite countries, including Canada, France, and Japan. United Nations Secretary General Youth Hunt uh, openly criticized America's policy in Vietnam. Further, opposition to the war ranged from the U.S. Senate down to newly formed pacifist groups and dissenters held peace make marches, marches, sit-ins and rallies in protest of the war and draft. Religious protest was led by Pope Paul VI and the World Council of Churches decreed America's involvement in Vietnam and called for a halt in the fighting as the most effective step toward negotiation. On August 6th, the anniversary of the bombing of Hiroshima, there were demonstrations in many major American cities, including uh, a peace vigil at the United Nations headquarters in the in New York. On August 31st, there would be another two-week-long peace vigil before the United Nations General Assembly building, and Mr. Larry Bogart had invited Prabhupada and his followers to open the vigil of praying for peace. Larry Bogart, who worked at the United Nations headquarters, had become friends with the Swami and had volunteered his help by arranging to print some stationery for the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. The letterhead was designed by James Green, Greeny with a sketch of Radha and Krishna and Mr. Bogart's name also appeared on the stationery at the head of the list of his con- trustees. Prabhupada accepted Mr. Bogart's invitation to the peace vigil. Prabhupada saw it as an opportunity to publicly chant Hare Krishna, so he was glad to attend. He announced to his congregation that Monday the 31st, instead of usual morning class at 6.30, everyone should meet at United Nations headquarters for a special kirtan. August 31st. Some met at the storefront and went by bus carrying kirtals and tambo rents and Swami's bongo. Swamiji rode with a few of his followers in a taxi. The typical dress of his followers consisted of white, well-worn sneaker, black pants or blue jeans and t-shirts or button-down sports shirts. Traveling uptown in the early morning put the boys in a light-hearted spirit and when they saw Swamiji at the United Nations in his flowing saffron robes, they became inspired. Swamiji began the chanting, but right away the peace vigil organizers stepped in and asked him to stop. This was a silent vigil, they said, and it should have prayerful, non-violent silence. The boys were crushed, but Swamiji accepted the restriction and began silently chanting on his beats. A dignitary stood up before the assembly and made a short speech in which he mentioned Gandhi and then he turned to Prabhupada and indicated that he could now speak about peace. Standing directly, the UN skyscraper looming behind him, Swamiji spoke in a soft voice. The world must accept that God is the proprietor of everything and the friend of everyone, he said. Only then can we have real peace. Mr. Bogart had scheduled the Swami for two hours of silent prayer. Prabhupada had the devotees sit together and softly chant Japa until their two scheduled hours were up. Then they left. As Prabhupada rode back downtown in the heavy morning traffic, he said New York reminded him of Calcutta. Amid the start and stop motion and noise of traffic, he explained, We have nothing to do with peace vigils. We simply want to spread this chanting of the Hare Krishna. That's all. If people take to this chanting, Peace will automatically come. Then they won't have to artificially try to for peace. September 1. The New York Post ran a picture of Swamiji's group at the United Nations building. Steve brought the clipping into Prabhupada. Swamiji, look, they have referred to you here as Sami Krishna. 
Prabhupada, Sami Krishna, that's all right. In the picture, some of the boys were sitting with their heads resting on their arms. Where are you? Prabhupada asked. She pointed. Oh, you chant like this with your head up, head down. Prabhupada had participated in the peace vigil to oblige his contact, Mr. Bogart. Now Mr. Bogart was phoning to offer his appreciation and agreeing to visit the storefront. He wanted to help and he would discuss how the Swami could work with the United Nations and how he could solicit help from important people for his movement of Indian culture and peace. Prabhupada regarded Mr. Bogart's imminent visit as very important as he wanted to cook for him personally and receive him in his apartment with the best hospitality. When the day arrived, Prabhupada and Keith cooked together in the small kitchen for several hours, making the best Indian delicacies. Prabhupada posted Stanley downstairs and told him uh, not to allow anyone to come up while he was cooking the feast for Mr. Bogart. Stanley assented blinking his eyes with his far-off saintly look. Stanley sta- stationed himself downstairs in the storefront. A few of the boys were there, and he told them, You can't go up to see the Swami. No one can. About twelve noon, Larry Bogart arrived, pale, elderly, and well-dressed by low East Side standards. Standards. Sorry. I miss somewhere. Okay. So, yeah. He said he wanted to see Swami Bhaktivedanta. Sorry, Stanley informed him his boyish face, boyish face trying to impress the stranger with the seriousness of the order. The Swami is busy now and he said no one can see him. Mr. Boga decided he would wait. There was no chair in the storefront but Stanley brought his him a folding chair. It was a hot day. Mr. Boga looked at his watch several times. Half an hour passed. Stanley sat chanting and uh, sometimes staring off blankly. After an hour, Mr. Boga asked if he could see the Swami now. Stanley assured him that he could not and Mr. Boga left in a half. Upstairs, Swamiji had become anxious, wondering why Mr. Bogart had not arrived. Finally, he sent Keith downstairs. Sandy told him about the man whom he had turned away. What? Keith exploded. But that was... Within moments, Swamiji heard what had happened. He became furious. He came down to the storefront. You fool, you silly fool. You turned and angrily... Uh, he turned and angrily rebuked everyone in the room, but mostly uh, Stanley. No one had ever seen the Swami so angry. Then Swamiji walked away in disgust and returned to his apartment. Stanley had been uh, going off the deep end for some time and now he became even more abstracted in his behavior. Stanley's mother knew her son had been troubled for years and she had therefore requested Prabhupada to keep a few close watch on him. But now the boy deteriorated in his responsibilities and stopped cleaning the kitchen and storefront. He would stand alone looking at something. He was gloomy and sometimes spoke of suicide and he stopped chanting regularly. The boys didn't know what to do, but they thought perhaps he should be sent home to his mother. One day Stanley went up to see the Swami. He came in and sat down. Prabhupada, yes. Stanley, may I have $50? Prabhupada, why? Prabhupada used to uh, handle all the money himself. So when his boys needed something, even if it were only 25 cents for the bus, they had to see Swami. He was never wasteful. He was so fragile that whenever he received a letter, he would carefully tear the envelope apart and use the reverse side as writing paper. So he wanted to know why Stanley wanted $50. Stanley replied in a small voice, I want to purchase some gasoline and set myself on fire. Prabhupada saw Chuck at the doorway and told him to call Bruce at once. Bruce quickly came up and sat with Prabhupada and Stanley. Prabhupada told Bruce, whom he had recently appointed to handle pity cash, 
to give Stanley $50 and he had Stanley repeated, repeat why he wanted the money. But Swamiji, Bruce protested, we don't have that, that much money. There, you see Stanley, Prabhupada spoke very calmly. Bruce says we don't have the money. Then they phoned Stanley's mother. Later, Prabhupada said that because Stanley had asked for $50 for gasoline, which cost only 35 cents, he couldn't, could therefore understand Stanley was crazy. Keith was cooking lunch in the kitchen uh, as usual, but today Swamiji was standing by the kitchen stove watching his pupil. Um, Keith paused and looked up from his cooking. Swamiji, could I become your disciple? Yes, Prabhupada replied. Why not? Your name will be Krishna Das. This simple exchange was the first request for discipline discipleship and Prabhupada's first granting of initiation. But there was more to it than that. Prabhupada announced that he would soon hold an initiation. What in, what's initiation, Swamiji? One of the boys asked, and Prabhupada replied, I will tell you later. First, they had to have beads. Keith went to Tandy's Leathers Company and bought half-inch wooden beads and cord to string them on. It was much better, Swamiji said, to count on beats while chanting a strand of one or eight to be exact. This employed the sense of touch and like the Vaishnavas of India, one could count how many times one chanted the mantra. Some devotees in India had a string of more than a thousand beats, he had said, and they would chant through them again and again. He thought that he thought he taught the boys how to tie a double knot between each of the 108 beats. The number 108 had a special significance. There were 108 Upanishads as well as 108 principal gopis, the chief devotees of Lord Krishna. The initiates would be taking vows, he said, and one vow would be to chant a prescribed number of rounds on the beats each day. About a dozen of Swamiji's boys were eligible, but there were no strict system for their selection. If they wanted to or they could do it. Steve, although I was already doing whatever Swamiji recommended, I sensed that initiation was a heavy commitment and with my last strong impulses to remain completely independent, I hesitated to take initiation. Prabhupada's friend saw the initiation in different ways. Some saw it was a, as it as very serious and some took it to be like a party or ha happening while stringing their beards in courtyard valley and Howard talked a few days before the ceremony. Valley, it's just a formality. You accept Swamiji as your spiritual master. Howard, what does that entail? Valley, nobody is very sure. In India, there's a standard practice. Don't you think you want to take him as spiritual master? Howard, I don't know. I would seem to be a good spiritual, uh, sorry, he would seem to be a good spiritual master. Whatever that is, I mean, I like him and his teachings a lot. So I guess, in a way, he is already my spiritual master. I just don't understand how it would change the situation. Well, neither do I. I guess it doesn't. It's a formality. September 8, Jan Janmashtami Day, the appearance of uh, Day of Lord Krishna. One year before Prabhupada had observed Krishna's birthday at sea aboard the Jaladuta, just out of Colombo. Now, exactly one year later, he had a small crew of Hare Krishna chanters. He would gather them all together, had them observe, sorry, have them observe a day of chanting, reading spiritual, sorry, reading scriptures, fasting and feasting, and uh, the next day would be initiation. At six o'clock, Prabhupada came down and was about to give his morning class as usual when one of the boys asked if he would re read from his own manuscript. Prabhupada appeared shy, yet he did not hide his pleasure at having uh, been asked to read his own Bhagavad Gita commentary. Usually, he would read a verse from Dr. Radhakrishna's Oxford edition of Gita. Although the commentary uh, presented impersonalist philosophy, the translation Prabhupada said were 90% accurate. But this morning, he sent Roy up to fetch his manuscript and for an hour he read from his typewritten uh, pages. For observing Janmashtami, there were special rules. 
there should be no eating and the day was to be spent chanting reading and discussing krishna consciousness if anyone become too became too weak he said there was fruit in the kitchen but better that they fast until the feast at midnight just like the devotees in india he said that in india millions of people hindu muslim or whatever observed the birthday of lord krishna and in every temple there were festivities and celebrations of the past times of krishna and now he said at length i will tell you what is it meant by initiation initiation means that the spiritual master accepts the student and agrees to take charge and the student accepts the spiritual master and agrees to worship him as god he paused no one sp- spoke any questions and when there were none he got up and walked out the devotees were stunned what had they just heard him say for weeks he had stressed that when anyone claims to be god he should be considered a dog my mind just been blown say valley everybody's mind is blown said howard swami ji just dropped a bomb they thought of keith he was wise consult keith but keith was in the hospital talking among themselves they became more and more confused swami ji remark had confounded their judgment finally valley decided to go to the hospital to see keith keith listened to the whole story how swami ji had told them to fast and how he had read from his manuscript and how he had said he would explain initiation and how everybody had leaned forward all years and swami ji had dropped a bomb the student accepts the spiritual master and agrees to worship him as god any questions swami ji had asked softly and then he had walked out i don't know if i want to to be initiated now valley confessed we have to worship him as god well you are already doing that by accepting whatever he tells you keith replied and he advised that they talk it over with swami ji before the initiation so valley went back to the temple and consulted howard and together they went up to the swami ji's apartment does what you told us this morning howard asked mean we are supposed to accept the spiritual master to be god that means he is due the same respect uh, as god being god's representative propas replied calmly then he is not god then he is not god no propas said god is god the spiritual master is his representative therefore he is as good as god because he can deliver god to the sincere disciple is that clear it was it was a mental and physical strain to go all day without eating yan was restless she complained that uh, she couldn't possibly stay uh, any longer but had to go take care of her cat propa tried to overrule her but she left anyway most of the prospective initiates spent several hours that day stringing their shiny red wooden beads having tied one end of the string to a window bar on a radiator or a radiator they would slide one bead at a time up the string and knot it tightly chanting one mantra of hare krishna for each bead it was a devotional service chanting and stringing your beads for initiation every time they knotted another bead it seemed like a momentous event propal said that devotees in india chanted at least 64 rounds on beads a day saying the hare krishna mantra once on each of the one or eight beats constituted one round his spiritual master had said that anyone who didn't chant 64 rounds a day was fallen at first some of the boys thought that they would also have to chant 64 rounds and they became perplexed that would t- take all day how could you go to a job if you had to chant 64 rounds how could anyone chant 64 rounds then someone said propad had told him that 32 rounds a day would be sufficient minimum for the best valley said he had heard swami ji say 25 but even that seemed impossible then propad offered the rock bottom minimum 16 rounds a day without fail whoever got initiation initiated would have to promise the beat stringing chanting reading and dozing went on until 11 at night when Uh, everyone was invited up to swami ji's room as they filed through the 
so as they filed through the courtyard, they sensed an unusual calm in the atmosphere and Houston Street just over the wall was quiet. There was no moon. As his followers sat on the floor content, content, contentedly, contentedly eating prasadam from paper plates, Swamiji sat among them telling stories about the birth of Lord Krishna. Krishna had appeared on his evening on this evening 5000 years ago he was a bo was born the son of vasudeva and devaki in the prison of king kamsa at midnight and his father vasudeva sorry his father vasudeva immediately took him to vrindavan where he was raised as the son of nanda maharaj a cowherd man propad also spoke um, of the necessity of purification or for spiritual master spiritual advancement it is not enough merely to chant holy words he said one must be pure inside and outside chanting in purity brings spiritual advancement the living entity becomes impure because he wants to enjoy material pleasure but the impure can become pure by following krishna by doing all the works for krishna Beginning, beginners in Krishna consciousness have a tendency to relax their efforts in a short time. But to advance spiritually, you must res resist this temptation and continually increase your efforts and devotion. And devotion. Michelle Grant I first heard about the in initiation just one day before it was to take place. I had been busy with my music and hadn't been attending. I was walking down 2nd Avenue with one of the prospective initiates and he mentioned to me that there was going to be something called an initiation ceremony. I asked what it was about and he said all I know is it means that you accept the spiritual master as God. This was a big surprise to me and I hardly knew how to take it but I didn't take it completely seriously and the way it was mentioned to me in such an offhand way made it seem not very important. He asked me very casually whether I was going to be involved and I uh, uh, also being very casual about it said, well, I think I will. Why not? Um, I'll give it a try. Jan didn't think she would make an obedient disciple and initiation sounded frightening. She liked the Swami, especially cooking with him. But it was Mike who convinced her he was going so she should come along with him. Karl Yeager, Yeager knew something about initiation from his readings and he more than the others knew what a serious commitment it was. He was surprised to hear that Swamiji was offering initiation and he was cautious about entering into it. He knew that initiation mean, meant no illicit sex, intoxication or meat eating and in an initiated disciple would have new responsibilities for spreading the teachings to others. Carl was already feeling less involved since the Swami had moved to Second Avenue but he decided to attend the initiation anyway. Bill uh, Epstein had never professed to be a serious disciple. Holding initiation was just another part of the Swami scene and you were free to take it seriously or not. He figured it out all right to take initiation. Even if you weren't serious, uh, he would try it. Carl Baker was surprised to hear that some people would be taking initiation even though they had no intention of giving up their bad habits. She had stopped coming around regularly ever since the Swami had moved and she felt no desire to ask for initiation. The Swami probably wouldn't initiate women anyway, she figured. Robert Nelson hadn't forgotten the Swami and always liked to help whenever he could, but except for an uh, occasional friendly visit, he had stopped coming. He mostly stayed to himself. He still lived uptown and wasn't into the low east side scene. James, Gre James Green Greeny thought he wasn't pure enough to be initiated. Who am I to be initiated? But the Swami has asked him to bring something over to the storefront. I came and it was just understood that I was supposed to be initiated. So I thought, why not? Stanley had been chanting regularly again and had come out of his crazy mood. He was sticking with the Swami 
uh, and his followers. He asked his mother if he could be initiated and she said it would be all right. Steve wanted more time to think about it. Keith was in the hospital. Bruce had only been attending for a week or two and it was too soon. Chuck was on a week's vacation from the regulated spiritual life at the temple, so he didn't know about the initiation. No one was asked to shave his head or even cut his hair or change his dress. No one offered Prabhupada the traditional Guru Dakshina, the donation a don disciple is supposed to offer as a gesture of his great obligation to his, spirit, uh, to his master. Hardly anyone even relieved him of his course. So Swamiji himself had to do most of the cooking and other preparations for the initiation. He was perfectly aware of the mentality of his boys and he didn't try to force anything on them. Some of the initiates didn't know until after the initiation uh, when they had inquired that the four regulative, uh, four rules, no meat eating, no illicit sex, no intoxication, no gambling were mandatory for all disciples. Prabhupada replied, uh, Prabhupada's reply then was, I am very glad that you are finally asking me that. It was to be a life, is to live Vedic sacrifice with a ceremonial uh, fire right there in front of room of Swamiji's apartment. In the center of the room was sacrificial arena, a platform for of bricks four inch high and two feet square, covered with a mound of dirt. The dirt was from the courtyard, and the bricks were from a nearby gutted building. Around the mound were uh, 11 bananas, clarified butter, sesame seeds, whole barley grains, five colors of powered, powdered dyes, and a supply of kindling. The 11 initiates took up most of the remaining space in front of the room as they sat on the floor, knee to knee, around the sacrificial arena. The guests in the hallway peered curiously through the open door. For everyone except the Swami, this was all new and strange, and every step of the ceremony took place under his direction. When some of the boys had made a mess of trying to apply the Vaishnava Tilak to their forehead, Prabhupada had patiently guided his finger up their forehead, making a neat narrow V. He said, he sat before the mound of earth, uh, looking out at his congregation. They appeared not much different from any other group of young hippies from the Lower East Side who might have assembled at any number of hip happenings, spiritual and spiritual, cultural, musical or whatever. Some were just checking out a new scene. Some were deeply devoted to the Swami, but everyone were, was curious. He had requested them to chant the Hare Krishna mantra softly throughout the ceremony and the chanting had now become a continual drone accompanying his mysterious movements as head priest of the Vedic rite. He began by lighting a dozen sticks of incense, then he performed purification with water. Taking a spoon in his left hand, he put three drops of water from the goblet into his right and sipped the water. He repeated the procedure three times. The fourth time he did not sip but flicked the water onto the floor behind him. He then passed the spoon and goblet around for initiates. He tried to copy whatever, uh, who tried to copy what they had seen. When some of them placed the water in the wrong hand or sipped the wrong way, Swamiji patiently corrected them. Now, he said, repeat after me. And he had them repeat one word at a time, a Vedic mantra of purification. Om Apavitra Pavitrova Sarva Vasta Gatopiva Yasmaret Pundari Kaksham Sab Yahantra Suchihi Shri Vishnu Shri Vishnu Shri Vishnu. The initiates tried falteringly to follow his pronunciation of the words which they had never heard before. Then he gave the translation unpurified or purified or even having passed through all situations one must remember one who remembers the lotus eyed supreme personality of godhead is cleansed within and without three times he repeated the sipping of water and the drone of hare krishna mantra filled the room as the goblet passed from initiate to initiate and back again to him and three times he led the chanting of mantra om apavitra then he raised a hand and as the buzzing of the chanting trailed off into silence, he began his lecture. 
after the lecture he asked the devotees one by one to hand him their beads and he began chanting on them hare krishna hare krishna 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 hare 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 ram hare ram 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 hare hare the sound of every one chanting filled the room after finishing one strand he would summon the owner of the beads and hold the beads up while demonstrating how to chant then he would announce the initiate's spiritual name and the disciple would take bla- take back the beads bow to the floor and recite namo om vishnu padaya krishna prasthaya bhutale shrimate bhakti vedanta swamin iti namine i offer my respectful obeisances unto his divine grace ac bhakti vedanta swami who is very dear to lord krishna having taken shelter at his lotus feet there were 11 initiates and so 11 sets of beads and the chanting lasted for over an hour propat gave each boy a strand strand of neck beads which he said were like dog dog collars identifying the devotee as krishna's dog after valley received his beads and his new name upa umapati he returned to his place beside hobart and said that was wonderful getting your beads is wonderful in turn each initiate received his beads and his spiritual name hobart became high griva valley became umapati bill became rabindra swarup kal became karla karlapati uh, james became jagannath Mike became Mukunda, Yan became Janaki, Roy became Raya Rama, and uh, Stanley became Striyadisha. Another Stanley, a uh, Brooklyn boy with a job, and uh, Janos, a college student from Montreal, both of whom had rather peripheral relationship with the Swami, appeared that night and took initiation with the rest, receiving the names Satya Vrata and Janardhana. Then Swami Ji began the fire sacrifice by sprinkling the colored dyes across the mound of earth before him. With fixed attention, his congregation watched each mysterious move as he picked up the twigs and wooden splinters, dipped them in the clarified butter, lit them in a candle flame, and built a small fire in the center of the mound. He mixed some seeds, barley, and clarified butter in a bowl and then passed the mixture around. Each new disciple took a handful of mixture to offer into the fire. He then began to recite Sanskrit prayers, um, asking everyone please to repeat uh, them, each prayer ending with the responsive chanting of the word Swaha three times. And with Swaha, the initiates, would toss some of the sesame barley mixture into the fire swami ji kept pouring butter piling uh, up wood and chanting more prayers until the mound was blazing the prayers kept coming and the butter kept pouring and the fire got larger and the room got hotter after 15 to 20 minutes he asked each of the initiates to place a banana in the fire with 11 bananas heaped on the fire the flame began to die and the smoke thickened a few of the initiates got up and ran coughing into the other room and the <clears throat> guests retreated into the hallway but swami ji went on pouring the remaining butter and seeds into the fire this kind of smoke does not disturb he said other smoke disturbs but this kind of smoke does not even though everyone's eyes were watering with irritation he asked that the windows remain closed so most of the smoke was contained within the apartment and no neighbors complained swami ji smiled broadly rose from his seat before the sacrificial fire blazing tongue of vishnu and began clapping his hands and chanting hare krishna placing one foot before the other and swaying from side to side he began to dance before the fire his disciples joined him in a dancing and chanting and the smoke abated he had each disciple touch his beads to the feet of lord chaitanya in the panchatattva picture on the table and fin- finally he allowed the windows open as the ceremony was finished and the air in the air um, apartment was clearing swami began to laugh there was so much smoke i thought they might have to call a fire brigade Prabhupada was happy. He arranged that prasadam be distributed to all the devotees and guests. The fire, the prayers, the woes, and everyone chanting Hare Krishna had all created an auspicious atmosphere. Things were doing going forward. Now there were initiated devotees in the Western world. Finally, most of the disciples went home to their apartments, leaving their spiritual master to clean up after the initiation ceremony. 
September 10th, the morning after the initiation, the Prabhupada sat in his apartment reading from a commentary on the Srimad Bhagavatam. The large Sanskrit volume lay before him on his desk as he read. He wore horn-rimmed glasses, which changed his demeanor, making him look extremely scholarly. He wore eyeglasses uh, only for reading, and this added to visual impression that he had now gone into a deep professional meditation. The room was quiet and brilliant. Mid-morning sunlight shone warmly through the window. Suddenly, someone knocked on the door. Yes, come in. He looked up, removing his glasses as Mike and Jan, now Mukunda and Janaki, opened the door, peering in. He had asked to see them. Yes, yes, come in. He smiled, and they walked in and uh, closed the door behind them. Two vivacious young Americans. From his expressive eyes, he seemed to be amused. They sat down before him, and Prabhupada play, playfully addressed them by their new initiated names. So you are living together, but now you have taken serious vows of initiation. So what will you do about it? Well, Mukunda seemed puzzled. Isn't there any love in Krishna consciousness? Swamiji nodded. Yes, so I am saying, why don't you get married? They agreed it was a good, a good idea, and Prabhupada immediately scheduled a wedding day for two days later. Swamiji said he would cook a big feast and hold the marriage ceremony uh, in his apartment and he asked Mukunda and Janaki to uh, invite their relatives. Both Mukunda and Janaki had grown up in Oregon, Oregon and their family members found it impossible to travel such a long distance in such short notice. Only Janaki's sister Joan agreed to come. Joan Little did I know what kind of wedding it would be. All I knew was that they were they had met a Swami and were taking Sanskrit from him as well as attending his small storefront temple on 2nd Avenue. When I met the Swami, he was sitting beside the window in his front room, bath in the sunlight, surrounded by pots of prasadam, which he had been uh, which we, he was distributing to the devotees who were sitting around him against the wall. I was a follower of uh, macrobiotics and not so eager of, for taking this noonday meal. When I entered the room, the Swami said, Who is this? And Mukunda said, This is Janaki's sister, Joan. She has come from Oregon to attend the wedding. Swamiji said, Oh, where is Oregon? Mukunda said, It's 3,000 miles away on the other side of the United States. And he asked, Oh, coming from so far, very nice. And when will the other members of the family arrive? Then I said, I am the only one who is coming for the wedding, Swamiji. He said, never mind, it is very nice that you have come. Please sit down and take some prasadam. He offered me some dal, rather moist sabji, yogurt, salad and chapati. But because I was a devotee of macro biotics, all of this prasadam was very unpalatable to me. Practically speaking, it was sticking in my throat the whole time, but I remember looking over at radiant and beautiful person who was so eager for me to take this prasadam uh, that he had prepared. So I took it all, but in my mind I decided that decided this would be the last time I would take this luncheon with the devotees. At any rate, somehow I finished the meal and Swamiji, who had been looking over at me, said, You want more? You want more? And I said, No, thank you. I am so full. It was very nice, but I can't take any more. So finally the prasadam was finished and they were all getting up to clean. And Swamiji commented that he wanted to see Mukunda, Janaki and myself for making preparations for the wedding the next day. So when... We were all there, there sitting in the room with him. The Swami reached over into the corner where he was a big, there was a big pot with crystallized sugar syrup sticking to the outside. I thought, oh, this is supposed to be the piece of the resistance, but I can't possibly take any more. But he reached his hand into the pot any, anyway and pulled up a huge round dripping gulab jam, jamun. I said, Oh, no, I am so full, I couldn't take any. And he said, oh, take, take. And he made me hold out my hand and take it. Well, by the time I finished the gulab jamun, I was fully convinced that this would be the last I would ever come there. Uh, then he began 
explaining how in the Vedic tradition the women's side of the family made lavish arrangements for the wedding. And since I was the only member of the family who had come to assist, I should come the next day and help him making the wedding feast. So the next morning at noon, uh, at nine, while Janaki was decorating the room for the fire sacrifice, stringing leaves and flowers, garlands across the top of the roof room, I went upstairs to meet Swamiji. When I arrived, he immediately sent me up out shopping with a list five or six items to purchase one of those items was not available anywhere in the market although i spoke to so many shopkeepers when i came back he asked me you have obtained all the items on the list and i said well everything except for one he said what is that uh, i said well no one knows what tumor is he had me wash my hands and sat me down in the front room on the floor with five pound bag of flour, a pound of butter and a pitcher of water and he looked down at me and said can you make a medium soft soft dough i replied do you mean a pastry or a mm, ps rust or short crust dough or pit brissy dough what kind of pastry do you want how old are you he said and i said i am 25 swamiji you are 25 he said and you can't make a medium-sized dough. It is a custom in India that any young girl from age of five years is very experienced in making his, this dough. But never mind, I will show you. So he very deftly emptied the bag of flour and with his fingertips cut in the butter into uh, until the mixture had a consistency of coarse meal. Then he made a well in the center of the floor, poured in just the right amount of water and very deftly and expertly kneaded it into a velvety, smooth, medium-sized dough. He then brought in a tray of cooked potatoes, mashed them in with his fingertips and began to sprinkle in spices. He showed me how to make and form potato kachoris, which is fried in Indian pastries with spiced potato filling. From 11 until 5 that afternoon, I sat in this one room making potato kachuri. <laughs> Meanwhile, in the course of the same afternoon, Swamiji brought in 15 other special vegetarian dishes, each one in a large enough quantity for 40 persons, and he had made them single-handedly in his small, narrow kitchen. It was rather hot that afternoon, and I was perspiring. I asked Swamiji, may I please have a glass of water? He peeked his head around the door and said, go wash your hands. I immediately did so, and when I returned, Swamiji had a glass of water for me. He explained to me that while preparing this food for offering to the Supreme Lord, one should not think of eating or drinking anything. So after drinking the glass of water, I went in and washed my hands and sat down. About two in afternoon, I said, Swamiji, may I have a cigarette? And he peeked his head around the corner and said, go wash your hands. So I did. And when I came back, he explained to me the four rules of Krishna consciousness. I continued to make the kachoris and around 30, uh, sorry, 3, 30, 4 o'clock, it was extremely warm in the room. And as Swamiji was bringing in one of his preparations, I was wiping my arms and hand across my forehead he looked down at me and said please go and wash your hands again i did so and upon returning he had a moistened paper towel for me he explained that cooking for krishna requires required certain standards of cleanliness and purity that were different than the ones i was accustomed to about 30 people attended the decorations were similar to the ones for the initiation a few days before except that they were more festive and the fest feast was more lavish swamiji's front room was decorated with pine bows and leaves and flowers were strung overhead from one side of the room to the other some of the new initiates came their large red beads around their necks they had taken vows now, 16 rounds a day, and they chanted on their beats just as Swamiji had shown them, and they happily, though uh, self-consciously, called one another by their new spiritual names. Janaki Swamiji said that I should wear a sari at my wedding, and he said uh, it should be made of silk. I asked him what color, and he said red. So Mukunda bought me an absolutely elegant sari and some very nice jewelry 
the swami's friends were used to see seeing janaki as she always came with mukunda but usually she wore no makeup and dressed in very plain clothes they were astounded astounded and somewhat embarrassed to see her enter enter wearing jewelry makeup and a bright red sari the bride's hair was up and braided decorated with an oval silver filigree hair ornament she wore heavy silver earrings uh, which mukunda had purchased from an expensive indian import sh- shop on 5th avenue and silver bracelets propa directed mukunda and janaki to sit opposite him uh, on the other side of the sacrificial fire arena and just as at initiation at the initiation he lit the incense and instructed them in the purification by water recited the purification mantra and then began to speak he explained about the relationship between man and wife in krishna consciousness and how they should serve each other and how they should serve krishna propa then asked janaki's sister to present her formally to mukunda as his wife mukunda then repeated after swami ji i accept janaki as my wife and i shall take charge of her throughout both of their lives both of our lives we shall live together peacefully in krishna consciousness and there will never be any separation and then propa turned to janaki will you accept shriman uh, mukunda das brahmachari as your life's companion will you serve him always and help him to execute his krishna conscious activities and then janaki replied yes i accept mukunda as my husband throughout my life there shall never be any separation between us either in the happiness or distress i shall serve him always and we shall live together peacefully in krishna consciousness no one knew anything of what was going on except swami ji he led the chanting he gave the lines for the bride and groom into exchange he uh, told them what where to sit and what to do he in fact told had told them to get married he had also cooked the elaborate feast that was waiting in the kitchen for the completion of the ceremony propat asked mukunda and janaki to exchange their flower garlands and after that to exchange sitting places he then asked mukunda to rub some vermilion um, down the part in janaki's hair and then to cover her head with her sari next came the fire sacrifice and finally the feast the special feature of the wedding was the big feast it turned out to be quite a social success the guests ate enthusiastically asked for more and raved about the sensational tastes propas followers who were accustomed to the simple daily fare of rice dal sabji chapati found the feast intoxicating and ate as much as they could get many of the mukunda's friends were macrobiotics followers and at first they fastidiously avoided all the sweets but gradually the enthusiasm of others wore down their resistance and they began captivated by the swami's expert cooking god he is a good cook said janaki bruce who had missed the first initiation was seeing the vedic fire sacrifice and tasting the swami's kachoris for the first time he resolved on the spot to dedicate himself to krishna consciousness and become one of the swami's disciples as soon as possible almost all the visitors personally uh, approached swami ji to thank him and congratulate him he was happy and said it was all krishna's blessings krishna's grace after the ceremony mukunda and his wife entertained many of the devotees and guests in their apartment the evening had put everyone in high spirits and high griba was reciting poetry then someone turned on the television to catch the scheduled interview with allen ginsberg the poet and much to everyone's happiness allen began playing harmonium and chanting hare krishna he even said that he even said there was a swami on the lower east side who was teaching this mantra yoga krishna consciousness was new and unheard of yet now the uh, devotees were seeing a famous celebrity performing kirtan on the television the whole evening seemed auspicious back at his apartment propad along with his few helpers cleaned up after the ceremony he was satisfied he was introducing some of the major elements of his krishna conscious mission krishna consciousness mission he had initiated disciples he had married them and he had feasted the public with krishna prasadam if i had that means he told his followers i could hold a major festival like this every day shila prabhupada ki jai
हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा प्रभु जी थैंक यू फॉर सच एन नाइस चैप्टर या वेरी नाइस थैंक यू प्रभु जी दिस वाज सो नाइस इन कनेक्शन टू इनिशिएशंस yes prabhu ji <laughs> last uh, 10 days back we had so same like uh, but uh, it's a different experience definitely it's the first initiation from prabhu pad and they are yeah. so fortunate they don't know anything just they want to become uh, disciple so initiation start from there and uh, yeah yes uh, they they have love towards prabhu pad so they accepted with that it's very nice uh, uh, explanation of each uh, um incident we can see clearly from the book in front yeah. of our eyes yeah yeah so nice to know details thank you prabhu ji uh, prabhu yeah. ji about mukund prabhu uh, did we hear somewhere also in some lectures about mukund prabhu or was he uh, uh, preaching or later so what happened yeah 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 he yeah, but i think there is a book na he there is a book that he launched biography mukunda mukunda datta or mukunda okay uh let us see but there is i think something called ryan ryan i don't know what is it called uh i'm just seeing um no no this there's a book the guru business is this the one um ah uh, ha 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 I have to see. There is one book. Uh, maybe is this the one? Let me check. I mean, I remember that there is a famous book. Hmm? Is this the one? Yes. Yes. This. This. Yeah. I re- I read this book halfway. It's very very nice. the miracle on the second avenue the reason is i also saw this yeah it had the uh, award winning book i mean i don't know if you see my screen or not yes i can see yes okay. yeah the miracle miracle on second avenue the work is a memorial memoir of mukunda goswami okay prabhu ji thank you yeah okay yeah it's already one and a half hour yeah, thank you so much for joining wish you a nice evening पंचकल्पतरभ्यश्चक्रपा